Good morning. Uh, today I'll be reading from Luke chapter 15, verses 17 through 24. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against you and against heaven. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. Thank you, Esteban. It's good to be back with you again. It's good to have Jesse back. Good job on songs. Jesse puts a lot of thought into his songs. You can tell every song has been centered about coming home and about this idea of prodigal. And so I really appreciate Jesse. No more going to camp, okay? <laughs> Lots of exciting things coming up this week. Ice cream, right? I mean backpacks and ice cream. So... Uh, if you took one of the cards, hopefully you've gotten everything here already. If you haven't, you have till Wednesday, and then we kind of need to reshuffle, count what we have, and make sure we have enough. I've talked to school secretaries here in the three schools that we're going to be taking things to, or principals. Sometimes the principal themselves called back, and they were just really excited about the fact that we are taking an interest in their school, and that we're going to be doing something for them. Because the schools we're taking to are kind of at the bottom. They don't get much help. They don't get much funding. And so for us to be taking some things for kids so that their kids will have backpacks because they have a needs assessment person at the school who knows what's going on and also taking something for the teachers. They were just really excited about that and thought that's really good. That'll lift everybody up and get them going. And that's what we want, right? For our kids to be taught well and for us to say, this is what Jesus would do. And so we want to be part of your life. We want to be part of your world because we want you to know what Jesus would do. And I think that's one of the things we're able to do about that. LTC meeting today. That sounds good. Lots of things going on. The only person I've heard talk faster than Ken Fox is Quest Wolf. My goodness, Quest. <laughs> He's quick. But it's good to be back with you guys. I learned a whole lot in Angel Fire, New Mexico. It was, it was a great time there. It was good to be there with some of the people. It was, it was small, but wow, such great speakers. And so you're going to be hearing a little bit more about that uh, in the next few weeks. This is a follow-up to the one I did a couple of weeks ago. We talked about prodigal son, and we talked about some of the things that happened with the prodigal son in the parable that Jesus tells about the son who decides he wants his inheritance, and so he takes his inheritance, and he goes off, and he spends whatever he wants to spend. He does whatever he wants to do, and finds himself in a very bad situation because he's run out of food, he's run out of money, he's in the worst possible job that goes against all of his morals and ethics, and now he just decides, I need to go back home. And that's really what it's all about, is being able to go back home, being able to find your way back there somehow. And so he decides and says to himself, I've sinned. I need to go back and I need to repent to my father. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against my father. And so he goes back to say, I've sinned. And I just want to be a servant again. Can you accept me just as a servant? 
And of course he does that, and as he goes back, he's able to go in, and the father comes out and runs to meet him and is so excited and gives him the big hug, and then he waits while the son repents. And the son does. He has to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And so as he does those things, you're able to see that he comes back and he repents and the father accepts him. And the father then says, now bring the ring. Now bring the robe because my son was dead and he's alive again. And that is such a tremendous story. Because that's what Jesus came for. That's what it was really all about is that people who are lost in sin might be able to come back to Jesus. And they might be able to see who he is and what he does for them as he came and he dies on the cross so that they are able to come back home. And so as you look at all of that, that's such a tremendous story, this acceptance, this repentance for us being able to go back to the Father and back to God and have that good relationship with him would mean that we're going to become a Christian. We're going to have that covenant with him. It would mean our repentance just like his and our baptism into Christ so that we go back into this household of God and we are joined with each other. And it's one of the most important stories you're ever going to run into. But there's another side to the story. And it's this other side to the story that we wanted to talk a little bit about today. Let me give you the context for what happens. If you back up to the very first part of the chapter, here's the context. It says, now the tax collectors and sinners were, drawing, were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so he told them this parable. And the parable he tells them first is about the lost sheep, and next about the lost coin, And next about the lost son. And so that's the context of the passage. The great thing about a story is it can hit everybody differently. And so he tells this story about this prodigal. And he's trying to hit these people who are tax collectors and sinners. And saying, you're a mess. You're away from God. You're you're not right with him. You need to come back and you need to be right with God. But he's also trying to hit the other side. The Pharisees and the scribes who grumble. And it's almost that that seems more important in this setting than the fact that there are sinners. So I think the first story is a lead up to the second one. It's important, it's, it's necessary, it's what we need to focus on. But once you focus on that, you've also got to realize there is so much more to this story. The main story is set up around sinners. And yet I would say in our world today, one of the biggest drawbacks in sinners coming to Jesus is the hypocrites they find in churches. And so listen to the rest of the story as we look at this. Verse 25, he says, Now the older son was in the field, and he came, and he drew near to the house, and he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants, and he asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. And he was angry and refused to go in. And his father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The first thing I want you to realize about this story is that both sons are prodigal. Both sons are away from God. Both sons don't have the proper relationship with the father because the father is throwing the party 
One son has finally come back where he wants to be in the father's party. The other son refuses to be part of what the father is trying to do. Now, does that sound like he's really with God at all? No. And in fact, you can see that tension that goes on between all of the Pharisees and the scribes and Jesus and, and how that just doesn't seem to work. They always seem like they're at odds. They're always critical. They're always judgmental. They're always trying to do things. And you can look at this part and you can really see what's going on. The older son's prodigal just as much as the younger son. He hears celebrating. That could throw you off a little bit. So he asks a servant what's going on. The servant knows the son doesn't. Huh. Yeah, why didn't they tell me? Maybe he was too far out in the field. I don't know what the issue is, but it's like there's a party at my house and I'm not invited. That would make you a little bit angry, wouldn't it? Well, he's more than a little bit angry. He's a lot angry. He feels left out. He's feeling forgotten, it seems like here. He is very angry. This little brother has come back again. I'm angry at the situation. I'm angry at the father. I'm angry that there's a, a father that would accept him back. And so as they're talking, this is not a good conversation. I want you to realize that the father comes out to both sons. Not just the first prodigal, but also the second prodigal. He runs to meet him and he repents to him. The second one who's already heard about the party and is not going in, the father has to come out if he wants to talk to him. So he comes out to talk to him and there's no repentance at all. Your son has wasted your property with prostitutes. It's the first time that's mentioned. It may be true. I don't know how he knows. He hasn't even talked to the little brother yet. But you know how things are. People find out things. That's just the way it is. That's the way the world works. We think email and texting is fast. You know, gossip is so much faster than any of that stuff. So he may know what happened, and he also may be very much exaggerating what happened because there has been no confession, no mention of this whatsoever. And we tend to tell people's, other people's sins bigger than ours. And that seems to be what he's doing here. And so as he talks about this, the father comes out to him, and here's the reason for his anger. I served you. I never disobeyed a command. You never gave me a feast like that, not even a goat, that I might celebrate with my friends. And this son of yours, not my brother, this son of yours, you have welcomed back in. There's so much jealousy and so much anger here. There's a couple of things you have to realize. The younger son is not with his friends either. You see, the older son didn't say, you never let me come into one of your parties, father. He didn't say that. He said, you never let me have my own party with my own friends. You're not on the same page here. The younger son isn't getting that either. The younger son is inside the place of shame. He's inside the very spot where he has to go back and face all of those people and say, yeah, I lost all the money. I blew it. I am the biggest loser, the biggest failure ever. And he walks in and he faces it. He says, because that's me. And he says, I'll be a servant just right along with all of you. The older brother isn't wanting that, isn't asking for that. He's asking for privilege again. Both sons want privilege. And that seems to be what happens, isn't it? We all want that privilege, and so he's jealous. Maybe he secretly wishes he had that wild side. I've run into that a lot, actually. 
Somebody who, you know, says, well, this person went off and they did all these sins and then they come back to church. And it's almost like, man, I wish I could have done all those sins. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever felt that? It's like, you don't understand. That guy's destroyed. It isn't fun. It doesn't leave you with something good. It, it, it leaves you with a complete destruction. And so, you know how hard it is to get over addictions? How hard it is to get over some of those things? And some of the people are going to say, oh, there's the guy that failed. You're always going to be the guy that failed. And the thing that he does is he owns up to it. You know what the older brother does? He wants to say, he's the guy that failed. We ought to always remember, he's the guy that failed. He says, no, no. He's the guy that came home. That's who he is. And you're sitting outside the party. You haven't come home. That's huge. Because I think God is saying to a whole bunch of people in the Christian world that you may have lots of religion. You may think you're there with God. And you haven't really come home. Once again, this is a clean story. And so it doesn't have a whole lot of things. But as you go in, and if you were the one coming back, would you like this guy looking at you the whole time? Hmm. It's going to be a really uncomfortable time, isn't it? Because his expression isn't going to change. In fact, it's going to get worse, and he's going to talk about you, and he's going to say all kinds of bad things about you, and he will not celebrate. He has no reason to celebrate. Why should I celebrate? Just because you're here. How sad that is. That people who are related to God, who have understood where God is, who have been working with God, would take that kind of an attitude. How sad that is when you get such strict legalistic people that have no forgiveness at all. They cannot celebrate because it's their task, after all, to straighten out the world, isn't it? Yep, you're the sinner, you're the sinner, you're the sinner. You have to repent to me. It almost feels like that, doesn't it? You know, sometimes there's people that actually feel that, that actually think that way. It's that basic anger that comes in. And that somebody's got to be punished for this, for doing something wrong. And they feel like, well, you did it to my father. It's my father's house. You ought to repent to me. No. You have no right to hold anybody's sins against them. You're a sinner also. You're the one that needs forgiveness. Get in the house. And instead they stand outside and criticize and point out and, and talk about all the things that are so bad about the world. That's one of the favorite things to do, especially it preaches really well, right? I mean, we can sit up here all day long and talk about how horrible our evil world is, how terrible they are, and all the things, and it would all be true. And it does not get us any closer to home. Do we need to say it? Yes, we need to say it. We don't need to dwell on it. We need to get home. We need to get in where the Father's party is taking place. We got to get this amazing grace to actually work for us, not just to be a song that we sing. We've got to get some of this to be not that we are holding anyone against them because we get too much arrogance and too much self-righteousness. And as you look at, I'm not just, I'm not trying to point fingers at you, but as you look at religious groups around the country and in the Church of Christ, yes, you find them wanting to say, you have to repent to me. I'm sorry, that's false. That is just not biblical at all. You repent to God. God is the one who forgives. And if somebody did something specifically against you, then yes. Go say something. And, and you want to be the one with the stone, right? You're going to throw the first stone if they don't. Exactly. Come on. 
we got to learn to get over some of these things. The angry son never feels blessed. Do you know any Christians like that? Yeah, I think I've known a bunch. Because they never allow God to act like God. The father stands up to the older son. The father goes out to him. He says, please come in. There's a party going on. Your brother is back. I've done all this. And he gives him all the stuff that he's done. And the father says, okay, bye. I mean, that's kind of written in between the lines. It's the, you know. He is not going to back down on his party at all. If you are not willing to forgive your brother and walk back into the house, you will be outside of my blessing, outside of my grace, outside of my will. You will be prodigal. And the father seems to know that because the older son wants to control the home. He wants to decide, this is what home's about. We have standards here. We have things that we're supposed to do here. And yes, we do as a church, absolutely. But that doesn't mean there's no forgiveness. That does not mean you withhold that in any sense of the word. The father controls the home. The father controls the party. More specifically, God controls the party. God says when someone's forgiven. It's not up to us to say, oh, well, you can be forgiven now because we say it's okay. No, you need to repent to God. And it needs to be straightened out with God. And yes, we need to know about it. Please let us know if you came back and talked to God. I mean, we got to know because we want to be in on the party. But it is never the point of leadership in a church to try to say who's out. It's God's party. He's the one that invites the prodigal back. Now, if you've got an older brother who refuses to repent and refuses to come in and doesn't want to be part of it, God is the one also who says, you know what? Just stay out here. I'm going back in. I've got a live son back in there. The one out here doesn't seem to be very healthy. Wow, this is such a powerful thing Jesus is trying to say to us. The Father controls home. He allows blessings. He invites. He forgives. One of the most telling things as you look at the ministry of Jesus is who comes to Jesus. And the ones who come to Jesus are the tax collectors, the sick, the demon-possessed, the sinners. And the ones who are critical to Jesus are the scribes and the Pharisees. No, oh, they come all right so that they can criticize. So why do people who would come to Jesus not come to church? I tell you what, that bothers me. All of the ones who were so attracted to Jesus, drawn to Jesus, because they had so much burden and so much sin in their life, why are they not drawn to Jesus' body, his people, his church? And the sad answer is they may be afraid it's going to be like the older brother. It doesn't take very many times of getting looks like this where you decide, you know what, I don't need to be part of that. The father doesn't allow it. The father says, you don't come into my party acting like this. But I don't know that we can keep them out. And please don't leave if you're one of those. <laughs> what I'm saying is both of these got to come together. It's the father's house. It's the father's party. There weren't celebrations before. There was no little brother. But he's acting like he wants to keep everything and control everything. He never understood what the father's house was all about, what the father was like. Because the father was forgiving. The father had rules. The father had work. But the father was doing things for him. 
And it, he wants above all to welcome repentant people. That's what he wants more than anything else. Why would prodigals even go to places where Jesus' name is said and that look is on the people? They won't. They'll stay away in droves. Somehow we got to change the look on our face. We got to change the celebration. We got to change what it's really all about. The Father is making a place where people come back. He is not trying to make a place where sons never leave. And I think we've thought that before. We're supposed to make everybody be good and protect everybody and keep them all safe so that they would never sin and fall away. That isn't the message. We are to be open and honest enough and secure enough where we're able to inf invite others in. So that, yes, if they stay faithful, that's great. They stay faithful. And if they don't stay faithful, we can welcome them back. The biggest trouble about losing so many of our young people is they find no way to get back home. That's really where we need to be. Celebration is what it's all about. Don't make a church where no one can come. Make a church that's open. Make a church that is a place of repentance. Make a church that deals with the sinful of, and the, the worst of the sinful that have repented. And that also has learned how to deal with anger. Because there may be people who come back and say, I just can't stand it. There are so many people here who have done so many things wrong. I know. Isn't it great? Give them a chance to show what Jesus can do in their life. To show what's possible in their life. This needs to be the house of celebration because people were dead and now they're alive. It's one of those times where this is what needs to happen. We need to never be afraid to come home. We need to be a welcoming people. Not so that it's hard for prodigals to get in. But a place that says, you know, it's your decision. We will hold you to it. You don't get to just come in and say, oh, just accept me. No. You got to change to be like God. I hope all this makes sense. I have to tell you this. The last time I preached about prodigal, I got accused of being a Republican. <laughs> I mean, if you know me, you know I am not political at all. <laughs> That's not the message. <laughs> yes, people need to stand up. They need to repent. They need to take care of themselves. They need to do what's right. And that's where prodigal comes in. But so does the older brother. He needs to deal with his anger. He needs to do what's right. He needs to repent of his sins. And he needs to accept that older brother. We need to make home right. Home a place where God makes us right. It's not up to us to make home right. God makes us right. And therefore, home is going to be a great, wonderful place. And maybe today you've been prodigal. Maybe today you've been against God and against some of the things that God's been saying. We invite you to come home. Or maybe today you're the angry one sitting there going, I've just been so upset by all these people who are sinning. Yeah, let's deal with yours first. It's time to come home. Shall we?